Hey, how's it going everyone? This is I Am Error, and I'm back with another tutorial on Unity. In this video, I'll be discussing how you can create a melee attack similar to what you would see in Team Cherry's very popular 2D action platformer, Hollow Knight. Melee attacks are increasingly becoming a staple of 2D action platformers, and Hollow Knight especially made great use of the mechanic, not just for combat but for exploration as well, and despite basically having the exact same melee weapon throughout the entire game, the combat mechanics and exploration features made sure that Hollow Knight's melee weapon never felt stale. So what makes Hollow Knight's melee attack stand out among all the other 2D action platformers? In my opinion, it's the feedback the player receives whenever the melee attack collides with certain game objects. So in this video, not only will I be discussing how to get a melee attack that looks similar to what Hollow Knight offers, but also get the functionality to have the player move in the opposite direction of the melee strike. Assuming you have some way of managing the player grounded state for your project, this solution doesn't require you to follow any of my previous tutorials to get the same result that I go over in this video, and there's a link to my GitHub page in the description of this tutorial that'll contain the new scripts for you to copy for your project, so you can easily follow along with this tutorial and understand how everything works. However, if you prefer to type out my solution as I describe it, I'll make sure all the code I go over is visible and easy to read on small devices. I also debated on splitting up this tutorial between two different videos because there's really a lot to cover, but I will be covering everything in this one tutorial, so without any further delays, let's go ahead and get started. Before we write any new code or game design, let's first take some quick notes on all the different aspects of a melee attack in Hollow Knight so we can get an understanding of what type of solution we need to make and how we can go about making it. Right now I'm at the very beginning of Hollow Knight. Let's first determine how many different melee attacks the player has, and what melee attack occurs when I press certain input. A standard melee attack will go ahead and have the melee swipe occur right in front of the player. If I'm holding up while performing a melee attack, the player will go ahead and perform an upwards melee attack, and that same swipe that was in front of the player for the standard melee attack is now of course above the player. However, if I hold down and perform a melee attack, the standard melee attack still plays, and the only way to actually perform a downward melee attack is to attack while holding down when the player's not grounded. So Hollow Knight only has four different directions in which the player can perform a melee attack. Now that we know what directions we need to solve for with the melee attack, let's take some notes on what feedback the player receives when the melee attack collides with game objects. The player moves horizontally in the opposite direction when the melee attack collides with most game objects. This feedback happens with every enemy type as well as certain platforms and walls. Now when I perform a downward strike, the walls that I'm testing out with don't actually propel the player in any direction at all. But if I'm jumping and just perform a regular melee attack, you'll see the player still moves horizontally in the opposite direction. Let me perform a downward strike on this enemy right here, and you'll notice the player moves up a little bit when the melee attack connects with the enemy. And then of course after a couple hits the enemy's dead. So far the enemies in Hollow Knight are the only game objects that propel the player in any direction when performing a downward strike. But there's this nuanced foreground game object that also propels the player upwards and then dies after one strike. Now I'll move down here where I know there's some spike game objects that can also propel the player upwards when performing a downward strike. However, unlike the foreground game object and the enemy, no matter how many times I hit this spike game object, it won't die. And that's of course true for the walls and other platforms as well. So basically for every enemy in certain game objects, the player will be forced in the opposite direction horizontally when the melee attack connects with it. And then for every enemy, foreground, and spike game objects, the player will be forced up when performing a downward strike and the melee attack connects with that game object. So we need to write a script that we can attach to all enemies in certain game objects that'll first manage health values and then manage if the player can be forced upwards when performing a downward strike. To manage the game object's health and what direction the player can be forced in when the melee attack collides with it, we can consolidate all that logic into one script. And despite some of these game objects not really having health values, I'm going to call this script enemy health. We'll attach this enemy health script to any game object that can receive damage and or force the player to move in the appropriate direction when the melee attack collides with it. I'll show you how we can control everything I just mentioned through that one script, but again that's only going to manage the health and if the player can be forced in any direction when performing a melee strike. We'll also need to make a separate script that we would attach to the melee weapon so it can determine when the melee attack collides with the game object that has an enemy health script on it and how much damage the melee attack should deal if the game object the melee attack is striking should have less health when the melee attack collides with it. So let's call this second script that'll be located on the melee weapon prefab, melee weapon, 
And then last, we're going to want to have a script on the player itself that'll control when input is detected. And then make sure at the moment the input is detected, the correct animations are playing for both the player and the melee weapon. And then last, control how much horizontal and vertical force the player will move in when the melee attack occurs. Let's call this third script that'll be located on the player Melee Attack Manager. Let's open up all three of these scripts and we'll first get started with the enemy health script. With all three of these different scripts, I'll first discuss the variables, and then I'll discuss how the different methods work. The first variable in the enemy health script is a serialized field private bool variable named damageable. By default, this variable is set to true, and as long as this bool is true, this game object will receive damage when receiving a melee attack. The next variable is a serialized field private int variable named health amount. This will be how much health this game object has when at full value. The next variable is a serialized field private float variable named invulnerability time. This variable will be how long the game object needs to wait in between melee attacks before this game object can take damage again. This will make sure that this game object doesn't receive damage more than once from the same melee attack. Next, I've set up a public bool variable named give upward force, and this bool will determine whether or not the player can move upwards when performing a downward strike on this game object. Next, I have a private bool variable named hit. This variable will work with the invulnerability time, and as long as hit is set to false, this game object can receive damage. And then last, we have a private int variable named current health. And this is, of course, going to represent how much health is on the game object at this current moment. Next, we run the start method just so we can set current health to health amount, which is, of course, going to give the game object max health when the scene loads. The next method I have is a damage method, which receives an int parameter called amount. And of course, this method will handle negating the current health when a melee attack occurs. The very first thing this method is going to do is first check to see if this game object is damageable, which by default is set to true, so it should be. But if the game object is some sort of platform or wall that will never die, then what we need to do is uncheck the damageable box in the inspector window for those game objects, so the player can still receive either horizontal or vertical force when melee attacking it. If this game object is damageable and is not currently in a hit state and the current health on this game object is greater than zero, then the first thing we want to do is set the hit bool to true, which will very temporarily stop this game object from receiving additional damage. Then we negate current health and the value of amount, which is fed to this script from the melee weapon script when the melee weapon script calls this method. If the current health value is less than zero after negating amount, then at this point this game object will be in a dead state. But in this tutorial environment, all I do is cap off current health to zero, and then make the game object inactive within the scene. In most games, this will go ahead and run a dead method, which will most likely run a death animation, and then of course any other logic that would happen when an enemy dies. But all of that is outside of the scope of this tutorial, so we'll go ahead and continue with the solution. So after negating current health by amount, if current health is still greater than zero, then we run this coroutine called turn off hit. This coroutine is very simple. It'll wait in the amount of invulnerability time, which by default is 0.2 seconds, and then all it does is set hit back to false, so that this game object can receive damage again. Now, of course, that's how the enemy health script is working. Let's next take a look at the melee weapon script. As mentioned, I'll start off with the variables first, and the first variable is going to be a serialized field private int variable named damage amount. By default, I have this set to 20, but you can always change this value in the inspector window. And of course, this value is going to represent how much current health gets negated every time the melee attack hits a game object. The next variable is a private reference to a script I have located on my player called character. For this solution and this script, the character script contains the value of what direction the player is facing, and if the player is grounded or not. If you have a different script in your project that contains those values, go ahead and reference that script instead of the character script. At the very minimum, to get this solution working, you do need to have a grounded state for your character. But if you don't have any value that determines whether or not you're facing right or left, there's a commented outline of code that can go ahead and at least tell you if you're facing right or left. But you will have to have some sort of solution to determine whether or not the character is grounded for this script to work. If you don't have any way of telling if the character is in the grounded state and aren't sure how to set that up, there's a link in the description of this video for my total jump solution tutorial in which I go over how to set that up. Go ahead and watch that tutorial 
tutorial if you need to do that first. But for everybody else, let's keep going. The next private rigid body 2D variable is going to reference the rigid body on the player. Then we reference the melee attack manager as a private reference, which the melee attack manager is going to contain a lot of values that this script needs to function. And I'll be going over the melee attack manager script after this one. After that, we have a private vector 2 variable named direction. And this is going to tell the rigid body on the player what direction the player needs to move in when the melee attack collides with the game object. This next private bool variable named collided will allow the script that handles the rigid body calculations to basically run and perform those calculations. And then last we have a private bool variable named downward strike, which will manage if the player should move upwards when a downward strike melee attack occurs. Next, I run the start method, which grabs the reference of the character, rigid body 2D, and melee attack manager scripts on the player. After that, I run the fixed update method, which is the best method to run in Unity if you're performing any rigid body calculations. The fixed update will be calling the handle movement method, which the handle movement method only runs if collided is true. I'll be going over the handle movement method very shortly. But underneath the fixed update method, we run this on trigger enter 2D method. And if you're typing out this script, make sure you choose the on trigger enter 2D method, not the on trigger enter method. Those are two different methods. But all the on trigger enter 2D method is doing is checking to see if whatever game object the melee weapon is colliding with has an enemy health script attached to it. And if that game object does have an enemy enemy health script on it, then it runs this method called handle collision which I'll go over next, and then feeds that method a parameter of the enemy health script on that game object. So let's take a look at the handle collision method next. This method requires a parameter of enemy health that I named obj health. The three different if statements will handle setting the direction as well as the collided bool, but I'll quickly explain how these if statements are working. The first if statement double checks to see if the enemy health script on that game object allows the player to move upwards when performing a downward strike, and then it confirms the input as well as the character grounded state. If all of that is true, then it'll go ahead and set direction to up and then downward strike as well as collided to true so that when the handle movement method runs next, it'll propel the player upwards. And the only way for this logic to run inside this if statement is if the player is performing a downward strike. But the reason we define the input this way is because the on trigger enter 2D method runs at the exact moment that this game object will collide with another one, which will be very slightly after the input's already been pressed. And so this is the way that I've come up with confirming input for this script at that exact moment the trigger enter happens. The if statement below this will handle moving the player down when they strike up. This if statement has less conditional checks because there's no way to exploit the game by moving down and we want to protect the player from moving upwards when performing a downward strike because that has the potential to break the game by exploring areas too early. So if the melee attack collides with something when performing an upward strike, it sets the direction value to down and collided to true. And this last if statement that checks to see if the vertical axis on the input is less than or equal to zero and that the character is grounded or if the vertical value for the get axis is actually zero, meaning you're not pressing up or down when performing a melee attack, then that means of course a frontward melee attack is occurring and depending on what direction the player is facing, that'll go ahead and set the direction value to either left or right. But regardless of what direction the player is facing, it'll also set the collided bool to true. You may not have a variable in your project that represents whether or not the character is facing right or left. And if you don't, you can replace this if statement that says character dot is facing left with this commented outline of code that says transform dot parent dot local scale dot x less than zero. And if you want a solution that handles what direction your character is facing, then there's another tutorial I've included in the description of this video that goes over how to have a sprite face the direction that they're moving in. After the three different if statements, we go ahead and run the damage method that we have on the enemy health script, and we feed that script the int value of damage amount, and then last we run this coroutine called no longer colliding. Before I go over the coroutine, let me go ahead and talk about the handle movement method. Remember, this method is being called by the fixed update method, and despite this method constantly being called, it doesn't actually perform any calculations unless collided is true. And if collided is true, the first thing it does is check to see if downward strike is true, and then of course if downward strike is true, it'll go ahead and propel the player in the direction value, which is set to up in the handle collision method when the downward strike value is true. And the melee attack manager script has two different force values for upwards and default force values. The direction value is multiplied by the upwards force value, but if downward strike is not true, then it basically runs the same logic, but instead of direction being up, it'll either be down, left, or right, depending on which if statement in the handle collision method ran logic, and then it'll multiply the direction by the default force. Last, we run this coroutine called no longer colliding, 
which will wait in the amount of time of movement time, and that's a value set up by the melee attack manager script. Its default value is 0.1 seconds, and then after that time, it'll go ahead and set the collided and downward strike bulls both to false. So as you can see, the melee attack manager script does feed the melee weapon script a lot of the values. So let me quickly go over the melee attack manager script. As mentioned, this script is going to have a lot of different values that the melee weapon script needs, but it's also going to handle managing the animations between both the player and the melee weapon, and then play those animations based on input detection. One thing I want to note that's different between the other two scripts that I've discussed is this script will inherit from my character script and not mono behavior. So if you're unfamiliar with inheritance, I've commented out some code that you can use if all your scripts are independent of each other and don't inherit from any kind of parent script like a character script. So if you're not familiar with inheritance, instead of this part saying character, go ahead and start typing out mono behavior and it should recognize it fairly quickly. But the first variable I have is a public float variable named default force. Its default value is set to 300. This will represent how much downwards or backwards force needs to be applied to the player when a melee attack hits a collidable object. The next public float variable named upwards force is how far up the player needs to go when the melee attack collides with a collidable object. And of course this default value is set to 600. I have another public float variable named movement time, which is how long the player needs to move when the force is being applied. As you can see, it's a very small value set to 0.1f, and the larger this value is, the further up or away the player will move when force is applied. Next, I have a private bool variable named melee attack. This variable is really just to help clean up the code a little bit, and it's going to determine whether or not the input is being pressed for a melee attack. The last non-commented out variable I have is this private animator variable named melee animator, and this is going to be a reference to the animator component on the melee weapon itself. These next two commented out variables anim and character are variables already established on my character script, and I grab all those variable references through my initialization method I've set up on my character script. The initialization method on my character script acts as a start method for child scripts. So if your project doesn't have any parent character script, then you can go ahead and uncomment out these lines of code. For this script, the only thing I use the character script for is to determine whether or not the player is grounded. So if that value is being managed by a different script other than a character script in your project, go ahead and reference whatever script manages the grounded state and then uncomment out everything from here to here so that you can run the start method and get all the references that I already have set up through the initialization method. So if you're running the start method in this script, you'll either need to comment out or delete the initialization method right beneath. But the only logic that I add to my initialization method that isn't set up by the character script is the reference to the melee animator, which is the animator component on the melee weapon. And I've got that set up in both the start and initialization methods. Regardless if you're running the start or initialization method for this script, the second method that runs in this script is the update method, which all the update method is doing is checking for different input, and I'll explain the input rather quickly because it's all fairly self-explanatory, and it's all more or less running the exact same logic but for different directions. In my project, I went ahead and set the backspace up as the melee attack button. You can change this part that says keycode.backspace to whatever input that you would want for your project, but when this button is pressed, it'll go ahead and turn on the melee attack. The rest of these if statements are checking to see if the following is true. If the melee attack button is being pressed and the up button is also being pressed, then we play the upward melee attack on both the player and the melee weapon itself. If the melee attack button is pressed and the down button is being held down while the player is not grounded, then we run the animations on both the player and the melee weapon for a downward melee attack. But if melee attack is true and neither up or down is being pressed, or melee attack is true and down is being pressed when the character is grounded, then we run the animations to perform a forward melee attack on both the player and the melee weapon. That's all the different logic I've come up with to go ahead and have all this work. Next, I'll show you how to set up a melee weapon prefab in Unity and how to add and manage the different animation states for both the player and the melee weapon. So let's go back into Unity. And let me show you how my player is set up as well as the melee weapon on the player. I've added the melee attack manager to the parent game object of the player. It currently has all the default values that I went over when discussing the script, but I've added three new animations to my player. The downwards melee attack, the melee attack, and the upwards melee attack animations. If you're unsure how to make IK based animations, I have a tutorial in the description of this video that goes over that. But these animations are only 10 frames long, which is very short. I'm going to slowly scrub through these animations so you can get a feel of how they look. But basically all they're doing is moving the left hand in the direction of the melee attack. Pause the video here if you need some time to make those three different animations for your character. 
But once you have your three different player melee attack animations, I'm next going to show you how to set up the swipe animations for the melee weapon. All the different child game objects of my 2D character are either the bones or the different sprites that make up the 2D character as well as IK points. But this very bottom prefab called melee weapon is the new game object I've added for this video. This melee weapon game object has an animator component on it that'll manage and play the three different animations for the different directions the melee swipe can go in, as well as have the sprite render for those animations and a 2D collider type that's needed for the melee weapon's on-trigger enter 2D method. Even though I chose a capsule collider 2D, you can choose any 2D collider type that you would want, but on whatever collider type that you choose, you need to make sure you check off this box is trigger. The last component on my melee weapon prefab is of course the melee weapon script and it has the default value set up for it. If you need some time to go ahead and create a melee weapon type prefab with these similar components, pause the video here. Once you have a melee weapon prefab or game object, let me go over some more specific values on the components of the melee weapon. For the sprite renderer component, I actually don't have any sprites plugged in there. The two different sprites are managed through the animation themselves, as well as the transform for this game object, and the 2D collider size and offset as well. In my project folder, I have the two different sprites that I use for all the different animations on the melee swipe, and even though I've already recorded these animations, let me show you how you can do that on your end. To create the animations, you'll need to open up the animation window, which if you click on the window drop down, hover over animation and choose animation. And while you're doing this, you'll also want to go ahead and make an animator window as well. So go through the window drop down, hover over animation again, and this time choose animator. If you don't have any melee swipe images, I've included these two images in my GitHub repository for you to download. But let me show you very quickly how to make a sprite based animation. If you haven't made any animations for this animator component yet, there will be a box in the middle of the animation window that says create new clip. Click on that and go ahead and save it in an appropriate place in your project folder for your different animations. But because I've already made some animations, I have to go through this drop down and click create new clip from here. And now we're looking at a fresh animation. Go ahead and drag whatever images you're using for your melee swipe from the project window into the animation window into the timeline here. And these two diagonal squares are called keyframes. I'll probably be using that word again while making the animations, and that's what I mean by keyframes. But right now you probably don't see these sprites. That's because we need to make the image a lot bigger, as well as move the melee swipe in front of the player. For my project in the transform component, I have the X position set at 17.5 and the Y position set at 5, and then I have the scale in both the X and Y set to 7. So adjust the position and scale of your melee swipe so it makes sense for your character. Go ahead and pause the video here if you need a little bit more time. But once you have a good initial position for your melee swipe, drag the second keyframe to the eighth frame on the timeline. And now when you scrub through the timeline, you should see the first bigger sprite as the first seven frames of the animation. And then on the eighth frame, the sprite is now the smaller image. Go ahead and copy that second keyframe on the eighth frame, move the timeline to the tenth keyframe, and then go ahead and paste that keyframe on the tenth frame. And you can use Control C and V to copy and paste. Next, we'll need to add two new properties to the animation. So click this button that says Add Property to the Animation window, then expand it to your Collider 2D type, and then choose both Size and Offset from here by clicking on the plus symbols to the right of those properties. Once you have both of the properties added to your animation, what we want to do is change the size and offset of the Collider 2D so that it covers the melee swipe. Before you make any initial changes, make sure frame 0 is selected in the timeline. And once you're working on frame 0, then we can go ahead and start working on the different size and offset for the Collider 2D. In my project, I have the offset X value set at negative 0.25 and the offset Y value set to 0. And then for the size on the Collider 2D, I have the X set at 5 and the Y set to 3. But really all you're trying to do is make sure the Collider 2D surrounds the swipe image. So find whatever values work best for your project if those aren't the best values. Once you have the size and offset on your Collider 2D squared away, copy all the Collider 2D keyframes you have in frame 0, and then paste them in frame 7. Then in frame 8, when the smaller sprite is now the visible sprite, change all the values for the offset and size to 0. We want the collider to be visible and around the swipe image when the melee attack would be occurring, but when the melee attack is over, then we want to basically remove the Collider 2D from the animation. For my project, 
I've decided that the start of the second sprite is the end of the attack animation, and maybe you want to have the Collider 2D for that image as well, so you can make the decision yourself if you want the melee attack to continue registering hits on the smaller sprite image, but really again, all we're trying to do is during the melee attack, we have the Collider visible and around the melee swipe, and then when the melee attack is over, no longer have the Collider 2D for the animation. But whatever keyframe is your last keyframe that can register a hit for the melee attack, you need to make sure you have the Collider size and offset set back to zero, so that the melee attack can only register hits while the melee attack is occurring. Once you have a good forward melee attack, and you have all the keyframes mapped out for the sprite and collider type, go ahead and copy all those keyframes, create a new animation, and now that you've actually recorded an animation for this animator, you'll need to click on the dropdown that has the animation name, and select create new clip, You'll need to create two new animations for both upwards and downwards melee swipes. So go ahead and create two new animations for both of those swipe directions. And this time I'll show you how to make an upwards or downwards melee swipe animation. The process is the exact same for both upwards and downwards. So once you've created and named both your new animations, go ahead and paste the keyframes you copied from your previous animation clip into the two new animation clips you made and we'll be adding two new properties to both the upwards and downwards melee swipe. So go ahead and click add property again, expand next to the transform component, and select position and rotation this time. And go ahead and add position and rotation properties to both of the different animations. Next, make sure you're working on the zero frame mark in the animation timeline window. Once you have the zero frame selected in your animation window, let's start working on the rotation value first. For the upward melee swipe, we want the Z rotation value to be 90. And then for the downward melee swipe, we want the rotation Z value to be negative 90. Then go ahead and change the position if you need to. For my project in the upward melee swipe, I found that negative 2 was the best X value, and 25 was the best Y value. And for the downward melee swipe, I found 2 was the best X value and negative 25 was the best Y value. But pause the video here if you need some extra time setting up your position and rotation values for your upwards and downwards melee swipe. Once you've worked out the keyframes for both position and rotation in both of the new animations you've just made, copy the position and rotation keyframes in the zero frame mark, and then simply paste them in whatever frame is your last frame for your animation. If you've set everything up properly, your animations should look like this for upwards and downwards. If while you're scrubbing through your different animations, if you notice something moving or changing for either the Collider 2D or Transform properties that shouldn't be changing for that frame, then you probably don't have your keyframe set up correctly. And for the upwards and downwards melee swipe, make sure your zero and last frames for the animations have the same values for position and rotation keyframes, and that none of the other frames in that animation have any keyframes for position and rotation. And then for the Collider 2D keyframes, make sure the keyframe values at frame 0 match the keyframe values at frame 7. And if you still have the Collider at frame 8, make sure the keyframe values between 8 and 9 match each other. But at whatever frame that you want the animations to stop registering hits at, the size and offset for the Collider need to be set at 0. So pause the video here if you need some time to finish up your keyframes. But now we need to set up the animator component for both the player and the melee swipe. Let's work on the player first, so select your player in the hierarchy window, and then bring the animator window front and center. If you're unfamiliar with the animator component and how it works, the tutorial I mentioned earlier that goes over IK animations is a great start, but all I'm going to focus on for this tutorial is just how to set this up, and if you want a better understanding of how all this actually works, go ahead and watch that tutorial. But assuming you already made the three different animations for the player melee attack, you should see those three new animation clips in the animator window. What we want to do is set up three new trigger parameters to have these animations play when they're called. So at the top of the animator window, make sure you have the parameters tab selected, then click on this plus symbol to bring up a drop down and choose trigger. We need three different trigger parameters for the animator window. And then we need to name these three different trigger parameters the same name that we gave them in the melee attack manager script. And the solution that I went over earlier this tutorial, I named these three different triggers forward melee, upward melee, and downward melee. But it's important these parameter names match exactly as they are in the script. So you might want to open up the Melee Attack Manager script, and then copy the orange text that you see for Upward Melee, Downward Melee, and Forward Melee in the script, and then paste them as the parameter names. Next, we need to create a transition from the Any State box to these three different animations. So right-click on the Any State box, 
then select make transition and then make sure the any state box has a transition to all three of those different animations that we have on the player. In the middle of that white line that goes from the any state box to those three different animations, there's a triangle. Go ahead and click on that triangle. Expand the settings. Make sure the option that says has exit time is unchecked. Make sure the transition duration is zero. Make sure this box can transition to self is also unchecked. Then scroll down this window a little bit until you get to where it says conditions. Go ahead and click the plus arrow to bring up the different conditions. And we want to match up the condition trigger for the correct animation clip. So for my melee attack animation, I should have the forward melee condition. The upwards melee attack should have the upward melee. And the downwards melee attack should have the downward melee. So go ahead and match up the different conditions in the transition to those animation states. And now what we want to do is have a transition from those animations to whatever is your default animation. For my project, the idle animation is the default animation. So right click on each of the three different animations and make a transition to whatever your default state is. Click on that triangle again in the animation transition line. We're going to expand the settings again. But this time make sure that each of the animations has exit time checked off. Make sure exit time is set to 1. The fixed duration box is checked off and the transition duration is set to zero for all the different animation transitions to your default animation state. I'll quickly click on the different animation transitions and you can go ahead and pause the video for each transition to make sure you have everything set up correctly on your end. Once you have your player animation set up correctly, we'll next work on the melee weapon. The good news is, is the process is basically the exact same. So let's click on the melee weapon in the hierarchy window to bring up the animator properties for the melee weapon. Just like we did for the player, we need to create three trigger parameters for the melee weapon. And in the script I went over, I named these three different trigger parameters as forward melee swipe, upward melee swipe, and downward melee swipe. But again, the exact spelling is important here. So if you need to open up the melee attack manager script to copy those different parameter names, go ahead and do that. Once you've created the three different trigger parameters, you'll need to create a default animation state for this animator. But the default animation state that we want is no animation whatsoever. So go ahead and right click anywhere within the animator window that's not an animation state. Hover over create state and then select empty. I went ahead and named this empty animation state as nothing, but you can go ahead and leave it as empty if you want. But now right click on this new empty state that you just created, and then select set as default layer state. And this should turn this animation state to orange now. We need transitions from the nothing state to all the three different animation states that we made for the melee weapon. So right click on the nothing animation state and select make transition, and then drag the transitions to the three different animation states we made for the melee swipes. For all three of the different transitions between nothing and the three different animations, uncheck the box for has exit time, set the transition duration to zero, and then go ahead and set up the matching condition for the different animation states. Pause the video here if you need some time to finish setting that up. Once you have the transition set up between the nothing state and the three different animation states we made for this tutorial set up correctly, we'll need to make animation transitions between the animation state back to the nothing box. So make a transition between the three different animation states back to the nothing box. And for these transitions, we want to make sure the has exit time box is selected, as well as exit time is set to 1, and the fixed duration box is checked off. Just like for the player, I'll quickly click through the different animation transitions so you can copy the settings I have on my end and make sure they match what you have on your end. There's one last thing we need to do for each animation that we made for this tutorial, and that's to make sure that each animation isn't set to loop. Every animation you make in Unity is set to loop by default, so you have to manually uncheck it for looping, and you can either look for the different animations you made within the project window, or click on the animation states within the animator window, and at the top of the inspector window you should see this option for motion. You can click on that to go ahead and find that animation within your project window automatically. Click on the animation clip in the project window to bring up that animation clip settings within the inspector window, and then uncheck the box for loop time for all six animations that we made for this tutorial. Pause the video here if you need some time Time to go ahead and do that. But now after all that work everything is finally set up and I'm going to quickly play test to show you everything working. Let me quickly first describe the scene that you're looking at that I made specifically for this tutorial to test everything out. This game object to the left of the player represents something that can be damageable and I gave a health value of 1 to and everything else is the standard settings.
These five different game objects that rise up like stairs are different platforms that I set up to test out my upward force so that when downward striking these different game objects, the player moves up. This last game object extending from the floor to the ceiling to the right is a game object that doesn't give a player the option to go upwards when doing a downward strike and would represent basically any wall within the game. So the player will move backwards when striking horizontally, but won't move at all when downward striking. Then of course any platform in this scene that doesn't have an enemy health script attached to it won't do anything when the player melee attack collides with it. So I'm going to hit play and test it out. First, I'm going to do a downward swipe on this game object that would represent an enemy, and the player is of course forced upwards when the downward strike collides with the game object. The game object disappears from the scene because its current health is now less than zero. Now I'm going to do downward melee swipes across all these different game objects that look like stairs, and the player bounces upwards when the downward melee strike connects with each game object. But now let me do a downward melee swipe on this game object to the far right, and you'll see the player doesn't move when the downward melee strike connects with the game object. But if I'm standing and do a forward melee strike on that game object, the player moves backwards. And for these other game objects, I can also move backwards when striking forward, but I can also climb up them when doing a downward melee attack, because the give upward force box is checked off for all these different stair-like game objects. If you would want the player to bounce only on top of a game object, then what you would want to do is have two different game objects making up a prefab, place one of the game objects on top of the other, make the top game object a lot skinnier than the bottom game object, and then make the top game object have the give upward force box checked, while the rest of the game object has that box unchecked for it. But that'll go ahead and do it for this tutorial. If I was able to teach you something new or you enjoyed the content, consider liking the video and leaving a comment. If you're not already subscribed to my channel, please also consider subscribing. And one last quick thing before I let you go, I have a course on Udemy that teaches you how to make a Metroidvania style game and goes over all the different popular features that you would normally see in a 2D action platformer. I offer a discount to my course through my website. A link to my website's in the description of this tutorial, but that's enough self-promotion for one video. I definitely appreciate you taking the time to watch my tutorial. And as always, stay safe and take care, y'all.